right, we'll get underway. Um, morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us at the table this morning. Um, I'm Juliet Allen, and I work here at Farm Focus in the education team. And we're excited to be delivering this online conference for you. Uh, we hope to make this part of a wider series to engage with our professionals. Today, we are joined by Lawrence Field and Geordie McCullum, who are here to share their expertise with us. Um, as this is a Zoom webinar forum, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box throughout the session, and then we'll respond to them right at the end. Um, these will be questions for Geordie and for Lawrence uh, of their content today. If you do have any technical support questions for Farm Focus, uh, we please direct those to the support team. The whole session will take about an hour and we'll be around for another half hour or so at the end to answer the questions. Just quickly want to um, have a wee shout out thanks to those who have gained their Farm Focus accreditation. Currently we've got 231 certified accountants with 17 silver partners, six gold and 17 platinum partners. So thanks to everyone who took the time to get certified. So our intent today is to provide more value for our accountants that are working with Farm Focus. And today we're connecting with industry experts to understand more about what we can be doing to elevate our conversations with our farmers and to make sure we're adding value at every interaction. Um, so to introduce our panel today, we've got Lawrence Field. Um, Lawrence is a chartered accountant who ran a specialist farm accountancy business here in Masterton. Um, he now concentrates on his facilitation and training work um, around the country, working with various industry groups. And Lawrence will be sharing his knowledge of how the workflow of Farm Focus can encourage a better level of accuracy and timeliness to help better utilize um, our customer meeting time. And then we'll have Geordie McCullum joining us. Geordie is a director of Wairaka Property Consultants in Masterton, and he's been part of that team for the last six years. This follows a 14 year career in rural banking. Um, Geordie's experience brings a well-rounded view of what is needed to be ready to take your opportunities. And he will share some key pointers with us and talk through some of the reports. So I'll now hand over to Lawrence. Thanks, Juliet. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this session. This is a great opportunity uh, for us to share some ideas, and uh, we welcome any feedback or questions uh, at the end. So I'm going to cover three, um, three topics this morning. As Juliet said, around workflow, this is kind of farmer workflow. Um, then around livestock, a bit of a hobby horse of mine, but I think we can do, um, we can all do livestock better. And then about speaking the same language with clients. So let's have a look at this uh, workflow in farm focus. I was uh, delivering a, a training workshop for, for sheep and beef clients down in Cheviot. And I asked the group, how are they kind of physically paying their invoices at the moment? And there was a real range. Some people were obviously still printing off every invoice um, and uh, you know paying it by internet banking and then filing it away. Uh, the other extreme is that, uh, and perhaps some of the younger ones in the group, were absolutely following this process on the screen. So they were using the invoice scanner to its full capability. So as we talk about there, whenever you make a purchase, it's gonna generate an invoice. Um, and these days, most of those come to us as an email. So uh, these farmers, what they were doing is they were sending that invoice to the invoice scanner, which means it would appear in Farm Focus, and then they were deleting it right out of their inbox, uh, gone for good. They had absolute faith in the system. Um, some of them, I think, were actually using Farm Focus through that export bank transactions to pay their um, to pay their suppliers. But what it means is that when the real transaction, the actual transaction, hits the bank, and um, I'm sure you've got all your clients set up on overnight bank feeds, uh, which is a real plus. That information comes through every morning. Then we can match the transaction to the invoice. 
And this is a, probably a key difference between rural and, and focus. And what it means is that we've got really rich data sitting in behind the transactions. We've got all that invoice uh, information. And, you know, in the past, we've had auto coding, which works well for transactions. There's a, there's a slight shift in emphasis now in that if our source document is our invoice, then we can set up invoice coding rules. And that's, you know, that will be content rich. That will give really accurate coding uh, information. So I was always a fan of, of records folders. Uh, I would set up all my clients with their records folders. Uh, essentially, uh, this does away with most of that. Um, even your bank statement, when you think about it, you could attach that to the last transaction of each month, uh, just as an attachment on there. So that information is there. It means that for farmers, the, uh, the Shangri-La or the objective of, of trying to go paperless or, or certainly less paper is quite achievable. And from, from our point of view, from an accountant's point of view, um, it means we used to talk about one source of truth, didn't we? Double entry accounting, we have to tie it back to the bank statement. Um, but you think about the queries that you would have either with GST or with annual accounts. And it could be the trade in on the motorbike. Um, it could be an HP purchase. It could be insurance. Um, it could be um, some slightly suspect um, coding of repairs and maintenance versus capital. If we've got the invoice, then we've got all that data there. And I see it uh, for accountants leading to far less queries in the future. The other thing that, uh, that this workflow encourages and, uh, and facilitates is is and this is from the farmer's point of view, is changing from that kind of batch system. And I'm sure we've all got clients who do their GST on the 27th or the 28th of every second month at a bit of a panic, you know, just before nine o'clock at night. Whereas as the invoices are coming in and what they tend to come in from the first to maybe the 10th or the 12th of the month, they can be, they can be forwarded through to focus. They can be coded. Um, any transactions can be matched up and it means it's a continuous process. And so we're right up to date. We've got a really good, uh, accurate picture of where we're sitting. So uh, I think um, Juliet mentioned accuracy and timeliness. So this workflow approach, I believe, will, uh, will increase bro both. Um, a typical query is around livestock. Um, and the coding of livestock, and um, whether it's purchases or sales, obviously with purchases, this process can be followed through directly. Um, if you, for selling livestock at the moment, um, the easiest way is probably just to attach that transaction, that invoice to the, to the transaction. So we've got the source documents if that needs to be queried at any, any stage. So, yeah, and look, I think um, whether it's farmers that have come across from rural or, or clients that are new to focus, a lot of people have absolutely embraced this system and, um, and are really enjoying it. Anything to add, Jordi, or you're happy with the workflow? Yeah, no, I just think from, from uh, my initial experience with clients and, and what you've described, the key to good information is getting it in there at the time. Like when you come back to fill in that information a month or even a few weeks later, suddenly you've, um, you've forgotten a few of those little details. So having the invoice come in and a process that gets it in there at the time, um, I think really improves the quality of the info that we, that we see coming out the other side. Yeah, neat. And I think in the past, often there's been a little bit of a disconnect between the budgeting and the coding. Um, and if we can, if we can keep that 
the coding as accurate as possible, then when we're looking at actuals or, or actuals versus budget, which Geordie's going to talk about, then, uh, then we, we can be confident that they've been accurately coded. Okay, I mentioned livestock, and we've often got queries around livestock. Let's move on, Juliet, to the, to the uh, livestock interactions. So I travel around the country quite a bit now doing, um, doing sort of financial skills type workshop, understanding your farming business with farmers. And I am still amazed at how much uh, people struggle with firstly stock reconciliations and, and, and even as I've got there, my first point, stock is inventory. Farmers understand that if they've got more stock that's more assets, the business is worth more. But really understanding the kind of mechanism and the consequences of stock on hand, increased stock on hand, is going to have an impact as on profit is quite an eye opener. And so I think as accountants, we can all do better at explaining why that is. Uh, and I guess the, the techniques I use is that if you've, say, retained more breeding stock, then that's like a sale foregone. Um, or if you've bought stock in, then there's no question that you wouldn't claim that purchase as an expense. So if we've claimed it as an expense and we haven't sold it, then we have to bring it to account. And so getting farmers to understand that an increase in stock is likely to mean an increase in profit, that's the first point. I'm sure Geordie's had this experience, but I've talked to many farm consultants who have gone out for a half day visit um, on farm, you know, hoping to address, perhaps do some modeling on farm acts or something like that. And they've spent the first couple of hours trying to stalk out, sort out the stock reconciliation because it just doesn't balance. We've got a whole lot of negative numbers in there. This year's opening don't equal last year's closing. So, this, I believe this is an area that, uh, that we can all do better on. And if farmers really kind of take ownership of it, it will, um, it will be a whole lot more meaningful for them. So there's a couple of th key things. Um, I probably haven't got on my slide there. I haven't got opening numbers. So we've got to get our opening numbers right. And I think most farmers now understand that our opening come, numbers come from last year's closing. The next two things, and you need, even if you've come across from rural, you need to manually enter these, is um, we need to enter values to be able to get a stock adjustment. The new EFS report in focus now defaults to calculating that adjustment. We had to bring it in manually in rural, but as long as the values are in there, then if there's any change in number, we will get a stock adjustment. So that's critical uh, into our EFS. To get a kind of profit figure rather than just a cash surplus figure, we need those values. The next step is that if you're wanting to calculate production, and again, I think Geordie will touch on this. Uh, so with my work with the um, RMPP and the action groups, one of the KPIs that RMPP wanted the farmers to calculate, all sheep and beef farmers, was their net production. Kilograms of saleable product produced per hectare per year. So Focus will do this for you. Um, and one of the neat things is if you're selling livestock, you can choose whether it's carcass weight or live weight. So it takes all that inaccuracy out of it. But again, if you've got a change of numbers from opening to closing, we need to have in weights. And I say to people, look, don't try and get down to the last half kilo. You know, as long as you've got a good reasonable figure and at the start, I would just use the same numbers for opening and closing, then uh, you will get, you'll get a good, uh, you'll get an estimate of your production. The next thing is, and again, I ask this as I go around the country and I've worked with some young shepherds and I'll ask them, how often do you do a stock reconciliation? And interestingly, the ones that are working, say, for a corporate or for a large 20,000 plus stock unit farm, inevitably they will say, oh, we do a monthly stock rec. 
we have a culture on our farm of counting stock. Every time they come through the yards or even when we're shifting, we're counting stock. And I think that's something that a lot of farmers could adopt. It's a big part of your assets. It's a key driver of your income. And so if we're counting stock, then there's, a no, when, there's no surprises. When you think about, you think about the, um, a revised working plan. So we've got actuals at the beginning, and then we've got uh, our budget or our working plan at, at, on the right-hand side. There's always a column down the middle when we're looking at livestock, stock on hand. There we go. Every month, there's an opportunity to correct our, our livestock tallies. You know, does what focus tells us we should have as stock on hand, does that match the tallies that the team that are out on the farm are reporting in? And okay, in the bad old days, we probably had a, a little Wrightson's diary that would go through the wash and we'd, uh, we'd lose all those numbers. Um, a lot of people now are, are using apps. Uh, it may even just be the notes part on your, on your phone. Um, anything that, that can be done without having necessarily having to have coverage. But, um, and look, some people have a whiteboard by the back door or a whiteboard in the, in the smoker room so that there's a, there's a good system to capture that information out on farm and whoever's doing the bookkeeping in the office can pick up that information. One of the enhancements that's come through with Focus quite recently is when we're looking at that revised working plan, um, if we are looking at the actual screen, we can just um, click into there and we can enter straight into the actuals, our births and deaths. So again, if you ever see a stock wreck and you've got minus 3000 lambs, it's because you're budgeting to sell all those um, sale lambs, but the actual docking or tailing tallies haven't been entered. You know, the actual births haven't been entered. So that's a whole lot easier to do it now. The other thing that I share with farmers, and, um, and this might be a kind of coaching aspect for you when, when you're working with, with clients, is remember the golden rule. So whether you're budgeting or you're coding actual transactions, you need to budget or code to what the animal was at the start of the financial year. Budget or code to what the animal was at the start of the financial year. And the two uh, most common mistakes uh, that we see are if you've got sale lambs and you carry them over balance date, and like this year, $9, $10 a kilo, there was a really good margin to do that. You're selling those in the autumn, in the spring, sorry, before they cut their teeth. Um, what will the invoice say? Generally, the invoice says lambs. It might say last year's lambs, if you're lucky. But if you think back, if you're selling them in August or September or October, what were they at the start of the financial year? Those sale lambs would have aged up to, to sale hoggets or trade hoggets. So we must code them as hoggets. They can't get coded as lambs. So that's a really common mistake. Um, and the other one is around 20 month cattle. Um, whether it's, you know, it might be replacement heifers that have been mated, you take them through, you scan them, uh, they come up empty, you decide to kill them around April, May, could even be June. You're killing those animals, you know, they might kill out at uh, 220 kilos, something like that. Um, and and you, everybody thinks of them as R2 heifers, but what were they back at the start of the financial year? They were R1 heifers or R1 bulls or R1 steers. The same when you're buying in, you know, you're buying in 20, 22 month cattle. Um, my, my trick there is to think about which cohort are they joining up with and what were they at the start of the financial year? Okay, Juliet, let's just have a look at the, some of the key times that stock come through the yard. Sorry, this is the PDF. Have you got that on your screen? The little PDF that we look, here we go. Okay, so second, second uh, row down, 
if people can, if farmers tell you that they haven't got any um, numbers on their stock, I sort of say, yeah, right. Because these are the opportunities when uh, we've got accurate tallies of our, of, especially of our sheep, scanning, shearing, set stocking, we're tailing or docking, depending on whether you're in the North or the South Island. We might be weaning, we're drenching, uh, and then maybe the rams going out, okay? So that's that culture of building up the stock numbers and we can work backwards or forwards from there to get, to get accurate numbers. What I'm trying to show on this little uh, diagram is the blue line represents when farmers or shepherds or stock managers tend to change the name of their classes of stock out on farm. So I often ask farmers, well, when do you, when do you maybe box up the, the tutus with the ewes? And so you're just running, running all the ewes together. And people will talk about around weaning or around Christmas or early January, something like that. It obviously varies from farm to farm um, and, and where you are. Um, the ewe lambs are an interesting one because if you're mating your hoggets, then we're saying you're mating your hoggets. They're only what, six, seven, eight months old. Um, and, um, but some people might, it might be when they start calling them the ewe hoggets. What I'm saying there with those blue lines is that that's what happens on farm. And I think some farmers probably need to clarify this to make sure all their team are talking the same language. But as accountants, we know that the, that the aging from a stock reconciliation point of view only happens at the end of the year. Now, again, the way I explain this is that it happens just before midnight. To me, these stock age at 11.30 on June 30th, you know, just before midnight, because what I would love the whole industry to be consistent on is that um, the stock age up just before midnight, so therefore they close as mixed age used two tooths you hoggets. And that's exactly the same as what they open as. Because the difference between closing stock and opening stock is we've just flipped over midnight. They're the same stock, the same age, the same weight. Um, and, and I think as accountants, when we are asking for tallies, end of year tallies, we should be clear that that's what we're looking for. We're looking for those aged up numbers. And therefore, I say to people, you should never have lambs or calves in your stock reconciliation because they've aged up. And if you see a stock rec that's got lambs or calves in it, then it's not correct. Okay. And so I think if we as accountants, if we can be consistent, uh, that will be a real help. Thanks, Juliet. Let's start talking the same language. Okay, now I'm not wanting to be over critical here, but when I ask farmers, oh, did your accountant explain this? Or how do you get on in the in your annual meeting with your accountants? Sometimes there's a little bit of this, and I'm not referring to my lack of hair. I'm referring to, well, yes, the accountant explained it, but it kind of went over my head. Um, and, and we might just be talking about things like tax planning, accruals, herd versus um, NSC. I'm not talking about imputation credits and, and um, dividends and, and um, all that other um, esoteric stuff. So one of the beauties of using farm focus as your common language is that there's great ownership of that, of that data. The farmers coded it in general, or you might be helping with the coding, but the, the farmer's been involved with the budget and the, the, I was gonna say the focus of focus is cash. And we all know that cash is king. So I think uh, it gives us a real opportunity to be speaking the same language that everybody can, uh, can relate to. I used to use the operating surplus uh, a lot uh, from the cash flow, or I guess if, we, uh, if we're looking at the EFS report, then it will include those stock adjustments. 
essentially that's our profit isn't it before okay before depreciation and before accruals but if you're talking tax planning and in the current environment you might be wanting um, some farmers to pay some voluntary tax I found it easy to justify that by referring to the reports that they were producing you know last year we had an operating surplus of 150 this year we're looking at 280 therefore we need to be paying some more tax whatever it is um, independent of whether a farmer is increasing or decreasing in numbers um, stock values to me are going to be up in 2022 so and i know in our part of the world a lot of farms are still recovering from a few years of drought so and i know stock numbers in the hawks bay were decimated so they'll be increasing there will i think be quite a lot of people whose numbers will be increasing so stock adjustments times those high livestock values could have a significant impact on on taxable profits so really good to get those values in there the other thing that's probably just a heads up is um, is this is an area where um, I think accountants can can provide real value to just be looking over their clients' budgets, their clients' working plan. I don't know if it's human nature, but I think it's easy to jump in and and adjust income, isn't it? You know, you might have been budgeting on a seven dollar lamb schedule, and it's quite satisfying to jump in and, and change that to nine or the dairy payout or whatever it is. It's more time consuming, and and not as easy to adjust fuel, fertilizer, wages, interest, all these things, and we all know that the on farm inflation is huge. I was at an industry update uh, just last week and based on a sheep and beef business of around 8,000 stock units, and, and this would be comparing to the budget they'd done back in probably June or July, the income was up 100,000 and expenses were up 84. So, you know, there's a real place for being involved with these decision making around spending because it may be perhaps the surplus isn't quite as good as we were expecting. Thanks, Juliet. Um, I say here that uh, farmers and bankers like a no surprises policy. Um, I've traveled around with bankers around uh, terminal tax date and they keep getting all these phone calls to approve emergency overdraft extensions to pay tax. That's not great for somebody's credit rating. And to me, I was really sad for that client because to me, it pointed to all sorts of things. A, they had spent too much money and they hadn't put anything aside for tax. They had poor communication with their accountant, the fact that they only had a week's notice. Uh, and, and why weren't they paying it in the year that they were earning it? So uh, in my practice, I was a fan of, I called it PAYB, pay as your budget actually paying voluntary tax in the year that we're earning it. Okay, it's a little bit sooner than you might need to, but um, it avoids any nasty surprises. Obviously the same with working capital. Um, I think Geordie's gonna touch on, it's a tragedy if a business has to make on-farm management decisions because they're short of working capital. It might be a reality for some businesses, but good planning, and good communication can go a long way. And of course, in a strong income year, there are opportunities out there. And so, and, and again, Geordie's gonna to touch on this, but look at the, my last point there. I say, let's get invited to the dining room table. You know, if there is a strong result, then, then how valuable is our accountant's advice to help people prioritize um, of that around, you know, whether it's debt repayment or reinvestment in the farm or reinvestment in the family. And so if we're looking at the same reports, then I think we've already got a commonality. Um, and as Juliet said, we can elevate our conversations uh, to a whole nother level. That's it. I hope I'm under time again, Geordie. Um, over to you, Juliet. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Lawrence. Yep, right on time. <laughs>
Um, no, that was really interesting. Thanks for that. Um, interesting to hear about the current issues we're facing at the moment with those increased um, expenses, you know, not just the income going up. So um, it just uh, points out how crucial the planning side of things is now. And then also that part about that golden rule, um, coding everything as it was at the, the open of the year so that we're all consistent in that and that's something we can all adopt. Um, so yeah, this leads into Geordie. Um, Geordie's going to help us learn how to harness this information and realise some of our opportunities. I'll just hand over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Juliet. Good morning, everyone. And um, impressive, Lawrence. Two weeks in a row, you're right on time. And uh, I called it one minute over, but that was probably the one minute that I, I stuck my nose in there. So hard act to follow. Um, yeah, so we're going to have a talk now about how to be ready to take your opportunities. Um, firstly, just a quick little background on, on what I do and um, where this fits in with that. Um, so a lot of the work I do is in the governance space, um, which includes strategic planning, um, it includes succession planning, um, and it includes, um, for, for different clients at different levels, the preparation of information, um, right down to um, a, a handful of clients where I do support them directly in their budgeting. Um, and so in terms of being ready to take your opportunities um, and springtime right now is a good example um, of, of opportunities that are around. Uh, I don't know what parts of the country we've got represented, but here in the Wairarapa, we have um, a large number of properties on the market. Um, there are also on farm a large number of opportunities. Dairy farming, are, are you trying to get your peak milk or hold your peak going? Um, and sheep and beef, you might be you might be buying, trading, um, all these sorts of decisions that that you're needing to make. Um, but at the same time, um, you are probably your busiest time of year, no matter what what industry you're in, cropping, dairying, um, sheep and beef, where you are um, running around busy. Then you've got these strategic opportunities, and you've got this really classic clash of where, where to put your time, um, where's the most value for your time, um, which is why it's really important that point one there, having good quality and timely information, being up to date, and Lawrence has probably covered most of this and, and where focus um, really, really is a standout and I think is, is automatically stepped people up in this space, uh, making sure that that data entry is good and accurate at the time you put it in, um, and avoiding those big catch-ups. Um, one day you, you look in the paper and there's, there's the farm that you want to buy. Um, you ring up your bank and all of a sudden you've got a whole lot of, um, of administration and catch-up to do. Um, so you're then able to get to the point where you can have a conversation with your bank. Um, so the alternative being having that information up to date, quality, um, timely, so that when you need to lever on it, you can. Um, the other side of it being um, the, the working capital, the overdraft facility. Um, critical that um, farmers are in a position to farm the farm and not farm the bank balance. Uh, so again, busy time of year, um, you're, you're making decisions on the fly. Um, maybe you need to put a bit more feed into the system. Um, maybe you need to buy a few more stock um, at, at high values. And, uh, but you're going to need a bit more overdraft to take care of that. Um, you ring your bank manager, and if you don't have the information available, um, then that's going to be a hard process. Um, they, look at your, they look at your cash manager, your farm focus. Um, if it's not up to date, you know it's going to confuse them and probably make the job harder. So really critical to have um, information up to date um, and on hand. Um, what is an opportunity? Um, so... An opportunity is a situation or a condition that's favorable to help you achieve your goals. So how do we know what a good opportunity or a bad opportunity is? Uh, the first thing we need to know is um, what is our ultimate vision and goal? What are our goals? Um, where are we trying to, where are we trying to um, go? Then when the opportunity presents itself, we ask a, a pretty simple question. Is this opportunity going to take me closer to my goals or is it going to take me further away from my goals? Um, 
we might use a little bit of instinct and intuition around that, um, whether, um, whether we think it will or not. But ultimately, it then comes back to um, being able to get good quality information again um, to line up, line up the option of acting versus not acting. Um, and that's all about decision making, um, making good decisions. And ultimately, your business, um, your business legacy, your career um, is the sum of all of the decisions that you make. Um, they, they range from that expansion of your business all the way down to um, pasture management and in those peak times a year, really making those good finer point decisions. Um, one thing I learned early in my career back when uh, in banking, um, they, they trained you up as a, a well-honed salesperson, um, is that the biggest driver of a decision is the emotion. Um, we, we all make decisions um, with emotion and then we start to back it up by logic. Um, and put all the numbers around it. Um, so, I mean, that's that's not a bad thing. That is, we are people um, and, and our emotions help us. Um, but what the numbers do is they help us, um, they help us to sort of balance out that emotion. It doesn't mean that it's wrong, um, but it brings the rationale, um, brings the rationale to the table. Um, and ultimately, whatever we're doing going forward, looking forward, um, we've got to make assumptions. And what's the best way to make assumptions? Um, it's making it based on, on what you've achieved historically, what you know you can do, whether it be um, production on a dairy farm, kgs of milk solids, um, crops, yield, or sheep and beef farm, kgs of, of carcass weight, um, lamb weights, um, lambing breeding percentages, calving percentages, all of these bits of information. Um, so with, with Farm Focus, um, it, it really does have a rich history of that information that you're able to build and make those assumptions on. Um, the better that information, the better the quality of it, uh, it lowers the risk of, of that transaction or that decision that we're making. You know, if we've got five years of production on a dairy farm um, of 160,000 milk solids, and, and maybe we can see um, that the, the highest was 175 and the lowest was 150 or something like that. You know, we, we can start to get a whole lot more confidence about what assumptions we can make. And that goes all the way through. Um, one of the ones I, I use quite a lot is the trends report. Um, it's cash based, so it's, um, um, it's just straight cash. I find it really good for the farm working expenses, the operating costs. Um, five years of history there and pretty quick once you've done a budget up to, to run it next to that trends report um, and tell, tells you whether, um, whether you have it right, whether you've got some justifications for, for reductions that you might be making, but ultimately um, you know, gives you some, some confidence in the assumptions that you're making. Um, so being the owner of your own business, um, so most of our clients do own technically company, partnership, trust, um, whatever it is, their business. Um, but what I'm meaning here is that they own their business in terms of, terms of decision making, in terms of um, when these opportunities are coming up. Um, that they, they can themselves come to a conclusion of what they, they believe is a good thing or a bad, um, a, a good decision or bad decision. Um, and then they utilize um, us, their um, trusted advisors, um, to, um, you know, at times it could be a line call to, to, make, to, to make those really finer point um, decisions on it. But I liken it too, and um, I thank, thank the referee on the weekend um, for the great example. Um, in terms of the TMO, the whatever they call them, the touch mat, TV match official or something in rugby nowadays. So the ref can go to the, the um, TMO um, and they can do it a couple of ways. They can say, we see an on-field try. Um, please give me a reason why not. Um, and the same for a business person. They could, they could go to their bank. They could go to their trustee, their their um, advisory board and say, we see a deal in here. This is what we're looking at. This is, um, these are the numbers. These are our assumptions. Um, give me your feedback, you know, challenge me on a few of the assumptions. Let's talk through it. 
um, or they can they can be like some of these refs that annoy us that uh, they just throw it up to the TMO and say try or no try you know I wasn't in the right place I didn't see it whatever happened um, you do the job for me you've got a video replay and and you tell me the answer um, so it's a bit like a business going to the the bank and saying farm farm next door's on the market can I buy it um, and and pretty much you're then at the mercy of of the bank or the professionals going through the process, putting their values on it, putting their risk appetite on it, um, and sort of coming up with an answer. Whether it's the best answer for you is going to depend on on um, probably how good a professional they are and how much they understand you and your business. Um, but the more proactive one, the one that um, the one that uh, lines up with your goals, your aspirations, your values. Um, is that you're the owner of your own business, you know it better than anyone else, you've got the information at hand, um, you're able to use that information, you're able to, um, when I say make a decision, you know, make a decision about what you think's right, and then you can use that team, those trusted advisors, um, to challenge you if necessary, um, or, or support you and, and help to fine tune it from there. Um, so those key stakeholders um, that I just mentioned, having them on board um, is critical. And again, farm focus um, and the way it's worked um, under cash manager rural for a long time now, um, being able to have your whole team around that information um, supports, supports this good decision making. Um, having um, reports that are built for your management decisions and then linking that through, um, as Lawrence has talked about, um, with the translator through to what the accountant needs, what the bank needs, um, and really being able to have that team on board. So come decision time, um, yes, the information's up to date, but also your key stakeholders, the people that are, are gonna be part of that, that decision um, are also on board. Um, key thing regarding um, your, your stakeholders, First rule for me is that, is that you've got to trust them um, and you've got to be prepared that if they if they give you feedback, um, that you've got to be prepared to listen. It doesn't mean you do what they say, but it, it means um, that you do respect their opinion. Um, if you don't, um, if they're just there for um, for the ride, um, then I'd say it's probably not worth probably not worth um, having them on board. Um, and then it's about um, building that relationship with them, sharing your vision, your values, your goals, so that so that they are able to support you in the best decisions for you. Cool. Next slide, Juliet. Um, so now I just want to um, run through farm focus. Um, the first thing I I um, do when I'm reviewing with a client is. Um, Around the governance table, or looking at, um, or looking at succession, or where people are going, is ask these five questions. Um, so, are they making progress? So, is their business going forward or backwards? Um, do they have the facilities sufficient to manage the best plan for that farm? So, that's what we've talked about already: um, farming the farm and not the bank balance. Um, are you on track? You've got a plan. You've got a budget. Are you are you meeting it? Um, How's your production? Are you making efficient use of your resources? Um, or is there some opportunity there? Um, and what are you investing in? So when Farm Focus came out, I jumped in and, and tested um, how this, how the report suite works for answering these questions. And Julie, it's just gonna bring us up um, a few reports and we'll, we'll run through them. Um, so first one, are you making progress? So this is out of the sheep and beef demo um, and the economic farm surplus um, is a report that um, has takes cash, but also adjustments in terms of livestock and um, a bit of space for some other adjustments um, that you can add in as well, which we'll get to. So um, if you scroll down a bit, I've highlighted, I mean, there's plenty of depth here, but I've just highlighted a few lines just to um, just to highlight what it shows us. So unlike a number of the reports, this one does a livestock adjustment. So we can look at, look at a farm's performance relative to its increase and decrease in livestock numbers um, and or value. Uh, so there in this case, 
we can see a reduction in livestock or sheep of $178,000 of value. Um, so if we're not if we're not factoring that in, um, we're definitely going to be missing the point a little bit um, on assessing our income. Um, scroll down a little bit more, Juliet. Uh, total farm income. So for a sheep and beef farm, um, in this example, um, we've got income of adjusted 1.2 million, which is $1,362 per hectare. Um, you can across the top there. Um, there's per stock you don't. Per stock unit on the far left, $102. Um, and if you're um, dairying um, kgs of milk solid, so you can reference it against your, your, key, um, your key metrics. Um, scrolling down, farm expenses. Um, also, just like the labeling, you know, farm expenses that make sense for, um, for farmers rather than some of the more complicated names. Uh, so farm expenses there, 565000 and uh, as a percentage of gross farm revenue, that's 46%. So nice and easy, run the report, uh, we can say, have we got an efficient, an efficient cost structure? 46%, um, anything below 50%, absolutely a, a, a um, very efficient cost structure. Um, getting over over 60 and, and we're probably heading towards or 65 heading towards um, a not so efficient cost structure. Um, scroll down a bit further. Um, so the economic farm surplus. Um, so just above that, you can see those adjustments. I should have highlighted it, but I, I put in depreciation of 25,000 um, to demonstrate if you, if you understand what your annual replacement cost and depreciation cost is, you can plug that in here. And it means we can um, show a, an, an EFS of 679000 or $758 a hectare. Um, you can also, um, under adjustments there, you might say that we spent $100,000 on, on repairs and maintenance, which is um, capital of nature and not, not um, an annual requirement. So you can adjust that out and you could also um, if you wanted to benchmark, you can use the management wages and um, get yourself to the level that, that you, know, you want to look at your business. Um, so economic farm surplus is about um, the efficient, efficient on-farm performance. Um, you then have your interest in rent, which is your capital structure. Um, and that leaves you, after interest in rent there, an operating surplus of 527000 um, and I've just highlighted there under interest and rent, again, the percentages, um, 12 to 13% of um, your income is going to interest and rent. So really easy if you've got rules of thumb, um, if, if you use the, the age old sheep and beef of um, sheep, of, sorry, charges under 25%, then uh, this looks like a reasonably well um, capitalized business. Um, and so that pretty much operating surplus tells me the only thing that's not in there um, is the, the drawings. Um, we could have incorporated that in management wage, but I can quickly look at 527,000 um, less drawings of 43,000 um, and, and a room full of accountants on the other end are gonna say we forgot about tax as well. So uh, yep, we haven't got, haven't got tax in here, but as I answered last week, the sheep and beef demo is the one magical place where we don't have to pay tax so we'll let that one slide so pretty much we can see what the business has gone forward or backwards by um, over that 12 months and you've got your other non-operating um, debt repayment and assets bought and sold Claudia, is it worth just mentioning um, if we go back up to the top juliet that the efs report is a great way to highlight what we can get out of farm focus beyond just you know kind of transactionally and and doing our um doing our gst so i would use this report to highlight um uh you know have we got our hectares right so does the stocking rate um, for opening and closing does it look right do the breeding percentages look correct do the deaths and missing look right um, and then Geordie talked about the adjustments. You know, if we haven't got any adjustments in there, then haven't, maybe we haven't added the values. So to me, the EFS is a really good place to start to kind of highlight the potential of what 
what clients could be getting out of their focus subscription. Yeah, and and uh, up there is the first flag you might have had around those, those stock adjustments as your stocking rate has gone from 13 stock units a hectare down to six. So yeah. if you see that and then you don't have an adjustment, um, you, you sort of have to ask a question. No, thank you, Lawrence. Um, yeah, plan page, Juliet. So our second question was, um, are our facilities sufficient so that we can farm the farm and not the bank balance? Now, plenty of information in here you can use also, but in simple terms, when I'm asking that question, I scroll on down the bottom first and foremost, and I look at that, and we've got credit balances most of the way across um, after the first month of July. Um, so once those all those extra lambs are sold, sorry, lambs or hoggets, Lawrence, fell into that one. Um, we've got a big cash balance um, from late spring. Uh, so it tells us, yep, we've got the facilities we need. Possibly then brings up another conversation um, with our with our trusted advisors is what are, what's the best use of this um, this surplus cash. Um, next question was, are we on track? Uh, so our variance report. Um, now the variance report is cash based. Um, so there's a, a couple of um, couple of limitations in this one at this stage around um, sort of comparing um, in adjusted income, um, but from a cash point of view, and cash is critical. Um, still really important to say, are we are we getting the cash in that we thought? Um, so income wise, we are up by fifty eight thousand um, dollars worth of cash. Um, a little bit of a vagary, which I think will probably get fixed, is that that percentage is has got a minus five percent. Um, effectively, we've got a five percent variance, and it is it is up in this case by fifty eight thousand. Um, farm working expenditure. Expenditure. If you scroll down to the bottom of that one, Juliet, where we got um, oh yeah, up a touch. We can see both the top and the bottom of the farm working at once. Just about. <laughs> Um, so at the bottom, I always start with the bottom, um, we are down in our farm working expenses by $85,000. Um, I say, well, that's great. Um, what's happening there? Um, and I look at the couple of big players, fertilizer, 19,000, um, and wages, 21,000. So sort of gives you a chance to say, well, is this, is this correct? Is that happening? If so, why is it happening? Have we been able to put less fertilizer on for some reason? Did we miss a round of nitrogen um, wages? Have we made a change? Um, that, that means that's the case. Um, sometimes whenever I see expenditure going down, because it's not a trend that, that easily happens, you sort of say, have we missed something? Have we revised the budget and uh, maybe uh, an application of fertilizer that was budgeted um, to happen in October, say, and it's not going to now happen till December, but we haven't haven't moved the timing. So a really good way to try and catch any of those glitches or misses where we we think we might be um, saving a bit of money, but it's just a timing difference. Cool. And down a bit further. Um, yeah, I didn't didn't highlight too much. The in interest in rent normally is pretty pretty um, standard unless there's major changes. Um, and interest rates, um, in this case, here we are, are a little bit out. Um, assets purchased and sold, um, in this case, and then loan repayments, um, a bit less loan repayments being made. So again, as I look at this, it gives me maybe a flag to say that there's a few timing things in here that, that aren't, um, aren't quite right. Um, drawings down again big flag whose drawings go down from year to year definitely not mine um, we're still climbing a mountain um, and they say one day it'll go down on the other side um, and then right down at the bottom ultimately um, income expenses so we've um, got a cash surplus of 311 versus our budget of 126,000 so an improvement of 184 if all of our, our data is accurate. Now that's on a full year basis. You can also do that up to any, any month um, year to date. Uh, I always like to, to use a full year so then we can try and eliminate some of those timing, timing issues. 
but year to date definitely has a use as well. Um, so then the next one is the livestock trading report. So for the sheep and beef demo that we're, we're doing here, this is, this is the one that gives us our production um, and just our, our sort of KPIs around our, um, our livestock performance. Um, so what I like about this report um, is that, and maybe Juliet, if you shrink it a little bit and try and get the opening and closing on, on there, yep, and scroll down. So this gives us our, um, our opening stock numbers, our closing stock numbers, and it gives us the values that we've put to them. So when we've got um, our op opening stock of 1.159, our opening sheep, closing at 980,000, and we can see all the detail in behind it. Um, we can see our numbers and we can see if, we, um, if we're out. Um, and also if you're putting in that, um, that the light are the, the closing weights, opening weights. Um, we've also got um, a changing livestock on hand in a weight, weight basis, um, which again is dropped from 151,000 down to 131,000. So it gives us a really good snapshot opening and closing of our livestock position. Um, scrolling down, so that's for sheep. Um, it gives us all the transactions of each, um, and you can open and close this as much as you want. As you see there, you've got every every transaction um, on each date of the of the livestock classes, and ultimately there a production per hectare, um, 150 kilos of carcass weight produced out of your sheep system and $847 per hectare um, achieved out of your sheep system. Um, so all about quality of information. Um, the most of that goes in at coding time with these invoices and capturing that data. Um, and then there, there, is, um, there is some adjustments and things that need to be done around livestock moving on and off and other things um, which require a little bit of a little bit of knowledge and skill, but ultimately, if you're capturing that base data, it makes that next job a whole lot easier. Um, scrolling down a bit into the cattle space. So again, open and closing, all simple. Um, but then you can, um, it gives you these, these average sale prices, average purchase prices. Um, so for your, your two year bulls there, you've got an average sale price of just about $1,600. Um, and an average weight of 318 um, kgs of carcass weight. So really good metrics to be able to um, do next year's budget and look at that. You can see the spread of how things were sold, the weights, the relative weights and prices. Um, so really um, powerful information. Um, down a bit, don't know if I've highlighted anything more. Oh, yeah, and then there's your purchase, so effectively, um, rearing calves, there's your purchase price. Um, so in a trading system, you can pretty easily calculate your average purchase. Average sale um, gives you a margin. Um, and that might be it on that one, Juliet. Yep. Um, so then where are we investing our money? So once we know where we are going forward, we are making some progress and we saw a surplus out the bottom of our EFS report, we also saw the cash in the bank at the end of our, our cash flow. Um, we asked the question, well, what's the best use of that, of that surplus? Um, and this is a cash flow detail report and I've, I've filtered it down. So we're just in that other, um, other expenditure space, assets purchased and sold. Um, so we can see there that um, we're upgrading a tractor, we're upgrading some gear. Um, Yes, the cash is there, so it's probably a good time to do it um, as long as it needs to be done and we're not just buying more toys. Um, loan repayments, so we've got a good amount of, um, of debt repayment going on there. And uh, down the bottom, I think, is just um, drawings after that. Um, but I don't know if, if any, any of you have used the upside down budgeting, but effectively, if we, if we were to do a budget going forward for this business, this is the space where you say, well, um, what are we doing this for? You know, what are our, what are our reasons for being in business? Um, personally, you might have some values around 
education for your kids, um, university, um, investment and different things in that space. Um, debt repayment's going to depend on your sort of business life cycle, whether, whether you're in a consolidation phase and you need to repay debt um, or whether you're pretty comfortable and maybe that's not top of the, top of the list. And where, where's the development at on farm? Um, is, is there any low hanging fruit, um, good investment on farm or is it mostly done and, and maybe um, it's about looking outside the farm gate um, for that investment? First thing you need to do is know that you're making a surplus. Um, then, you, then you need to know where you're gonna put it um, once you've got it. Um, so that's a, a quick, quick look at, at how I use farm focus, answer, answers those five questions using five pretty simple reports. That's all from me, thanks. Thanks, Jordi. Um, yeah, it's really interesting how we, yeah, you were saying we make decisions with emotion and then we, we back it up with logic. So it's it's key that we're all on the same page with those reports um, so that we can use those numbers and make sure we're all making the right decision together. Um, yeah, and those five key questions right there, you know, um, that we should be asking ourselves about every business that we're looking at. So no, thanks for that. Um, Lawrence. Juliet, can I, yeah, can I just jump in and give a shout out for the, uh, for the support desk? Uh, I remember when I, um, in my practice, when the bank link trainers used to come around and they would say to our staff, if you are struggling to work out how to do something for more than five minutes, pick up the phone and ring the help desk. So I think one of the standout features of, of Focus is the quality of their support. There are real people at the end of the phone um, a lot of them uh, come from a farming background. They know the program inside out. They never make you feel dumb. Um, and they, uh, chances are they've experienced your problem or can sort out your thing straight away. So there's that 0800 number, there's email, or of course down in the, in the left-hand side of the screen, if you're not working at 10 o'clock at night, uh, there's a live chat and uh, somebody will generally come back to you pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so really encourage, especially for your, your staff, you know, like if they go and ask a, a manager to help them with something, well, then the combined hourly rate there is pretty horrendous, isn't it? So encourage you to use the um, support desk. Hey, and just while I'm on that, Juliet, um, and I was going to interrupt you, Geordie, but you were too quick and moved on. When you're looking at the variance report, um, I absolutely agree. I like to look at that 12 month picture because it, it's, um, it focuses us on, on have we got our timing sorted out? Have we either doubled up on something because it was spent earlier or have we absolutely missed something out? And to do that well, I really encourage farmers to save a copy of their working plan as their baseline. To me, it's it's equivalent to the old save original in um, in cash manager rural, and you know in the old days when we would give a paper copy of our budget to our farm uh, banker, you know they'd put that in their bottom drawer, you know, or they'd scan it and it would go off to credit. That is essentially your business plan for the year. And too often um, I find farmers will go to do a comparison and they haven't saved the original. You know, they've updated it as they've gone along. So my window is in the first month of your financial year. Sometime in that month, when you think you've got your opening numbers, you've got your opening bank balance, hopefully your budget's all finalized, save, save your baseline. And then you've always got that. Back to you, Juliet, for any, any questions. Easy to miss that one, eh, Lawrence? Sometimes it is. as advisors, yep. we get out there and we jump on in and then we think, oh my goodness, have we did we save that baseline and a little yep. bit of little bit of free work to get it back the way it was so we can save it. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can always revert that revision line back and um, save down the baseline. But yeah, I think um good practice to try and do that every every two months, every GST period, perhaps. Hey, Juliet, I see the question in there that Alistair says is, is answered, um, but I, I think it's a good question. And just to touch on, um, for most people, 
the values that you use are pretty pretty simple and um and tax values are perfectly you know perfectly good um one to put in there um i do have a handful of clients where um they can there can be real large variances and we are trying to really understand their management position um and their their performance as separate from um from their tax position um and for example if someone's got um 30,000 um, lambs clicking into to hoggets just before midnight um, on hand at the end of the year. And in a year like this one, where um, the tax value is somewhere in the 125 ish zone, um, but the market value for those could actually have been um, $160 or $165 to or $155 to make it easier maths. Suddenly, 30,000 um, 30, animals at a $30 difference is yep. a horrendous amount of value. Um, so the answer, Alistair, is that um, you can pretty much, as long as you know what you're doing and you're consistent in your approach, you can use a formula um, for those numbers. It can just be um, herd values and, and aligns makes it works in with the accounting. But if there's a need, like in this case, um, we really do value those livestock at balance date so that these guys know what profit they've made in that year and then, then they carry it forward. They've then got to sell those livestock for a profit and we know what profit they've made um, in the subsequent year. Yeah, I would reiterate that, um, Geordie. I work with a client who did a lot of trading and, and they were in an equity partnership. So their performance as a manager was based on the reports out of out of cash manager and and we came up with a system they had really good live weight data so that around the 30th of june they would email their stock manager they would get a good market appraisal of the cents per kilo of what their livestock was worth and and that was repeatable it was justifiable but it meant that if he'd either bought well or he'd put lots of live weight on, you know, between purchase and balance date, that was reflected in this particular year because that's when he's earned it, not not when he sold them. And so I liked I liked that approach, um, and that's totally different to the taxable profit that some clever accountant might come up with. Mm. Yeah. Good question. All right, are there any other questions for Geordie or Lauren? We had a question yesterday or last week, didn't we, Juliet, around grazing. Um, and I've worked with businesses, especially when we were doing the net production calculations that say, did a lot of dairy support, you know? So they may have um, heifers on a May to May basis. They might be doing hogget grazing. Um, and, and I think it's, one answer is watch the space. Um, um, Farm Focus are doing some work around this. Um, and you might tell me this is not possible, Juliet, but my kind of simple, um, yeah, kiss, keep it simple, stupid approach was, was when, if you're using the beef and lamb calculator to work out net production, essentially what they do is any stock coming onto the farm are treated as a purchase and any stock leaving the farm are treated as a sale. So why couldn't you do that with grazing stock, put them in as a purchase, even if it won't accept a dollar, you, um, a zero, you might have to put them in at a dollar, you know, for your a thousand you hoggets or whatever, but put in the live weight data and then the reports, um, the analysis per stock unit and all of that kind of thing will actually be accurate. And you'll just need to know which of your stock on hand at balance date are owned and which are, are grazed um, and might, might be. Yeah, so that would be yeah. one approach. Yeah, no, so um, our recommended way of handling grazing stock on and off farm is to record as a sale or purchase. Oh, um, And you can... Um, obviously set up your own codes as well so you can separate out as the grazing stock and then any grazing income or expenses are listed in your grazing category um, throughout however the progress payments might work for that so when they're coming onto farm you're recording their their live weight 
um, when they're going off farm, you're recording their live way and you know exactly how much meat has been produced from your farm within that period. Um, so you're able to account for them that way. Cool. Yeah. Um, just so you all know as well, there will be a recording of this. Um, we'll post it up on our help centre. So if you do want to come back and have another look, um, or if any of your colleagues have maybe missed it and want to have a look, um, this will be up on our help centre under the webinar recordings. Um, so you can refer back to later on. Julie, it's probably also worth mentioning for some people may not have seen, um, in the latest release, we've got the current month um, as an option, haven't we, when we're looking at yeah. the revised view. Yeah, so that current month view now you can filter for in your working plan and that will pull through from your needs action screen any of your coded but um, unpaid invoices. So anything that's still yet to be paid this month uh, will be pulled into your working plan so you can get a really good current month view of if you were to pay all of those invoices, what does that do to your bank balance? Um, and and or do you have the facility to manage that or not? If you need to um, change the due date on some of those invoices to manage the cash flow better. Um, yeah, so that's that's a um, really, really good one now that we've um, just recently released um, to give handle that sort of more up-to-date revision now. And there'll be some good help topics on there, won't there, Julie? Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> They're already the up. <laughs> The key thing is that they must be coded, but they'll be, but they're showing as unpaid. So you might yeah, do so that any time from the tenth of a month onwards, something like that, mightn't you? Yeah. I mean, generally you'll get through your invoices from your suppliers as um, as soon as an order is placed, um, and if not, you'll be getting them through from the first of the month, that first week of the month. Um, so generally, by the tenth, you'll know exactly what you've got going out of your bank um, on the twentieth. And it will give you a really good view if you need to reallocate some of that or um, change, update some of your income as well. Um, but yeah, there's help topics on, on how to use that view. And not wanting to put you on the spot too much here, but is there a plan to be able to use the invoice scanner for, for income, for stock sales, um, for that sort of thing? There, it, it is on our enhancement backlog, but it's not currently um, in motion. But what you can do is you can still attach those. Uh, you can create an invoice record and attach any of those money in invoices. Or if you're really sneaky like Juliet is, you can put a negative sign in front of all the, um, all the amounts. We probably shouldn't say that. send but... it through the invoice scanner and just change the, um, the amounts to negative and the fill in the gaps and then it will pick it up. It will work. There's a workaround. <laughs> Manipulate yeah. it slightly. <laughs> yeah. Saving invoice to transaction is a game changer. Yeah, I agree, Al. So yeah, it is. It's huge. It's just being able to have that information right there. Um, you know, you get to your end of your, end of your reporting and you um, have your massive list of questions for your customer um, that you email off or you can go and answer a lot of those yourself now, um, which saves a lot of following up. <laughs> and, and I'd be interested to know, you know, accountants' experience, but I think for, for accountants that are preparing GST, uh, there'll be a whole lot less queries. But also, in terms of practice workflow, uh, you know, if you've got a client that's, that's got good information and you've got staff members uh, that, are, that have got capacity, well, then they can just jump in and make a start on those annual accounts at any stage. Uh, it's, it's looking really promising. Mm -hmm. Oh, Alistair's on the wrong track here. You're adding more value, Alistair. You'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, I think the other um, sort of a little bit conversation or two ago, but the flexibility and farm focus, um, like with, with all those reports, to be able to open them up really wide and see a whole lot of information or to shrink them right down um, and see a minimum, minimum sort of a summary um, within the codes and it's I suppose it's a, a positive and a minus but for me I like the flexibility of being able to um, being able to make things 
work right for a particular customer. Um, everyone looks at their businesses a bit differently. Um, and sometimes the, the systems that are just locked down and you've got to fit in there, they can be quite difficult to get a good picture of a business. So definitely, definitely very workable in that space. And it's it's um, different different reports for different audiences, Geordie, isn't it? You know, even mm. working with with um, farm staff or farm managers, you know, to be able to get them the reports on R and M or animal health or the things they've got control over is um, is really good. Oh, look, everybody's dying to get back to their um, to their tax returns, Juliet. There's no more questions. No, no. All right. Well, no, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and yeah, like I said uh, earlier in the session, we hope to make this a wider series. So um, look forward to your feedback and um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day.